Welcome back. Now we move to lecture four and we'll be talking about temperature and Boltzmann factor. So the main definition we'll come up with today is uh, temperature, but we will, we will also talk about Boltzmann distribution and we will uh, pr provide the first definition of what, temp what temperature is. So very often if you ask uh, what temperature is, you people usually say it's a measure of hotness. So how much heat or something that can tra be transferred from a hot object. But that's not a really accurate description, of course, and we want something a little bit more formal, a little bit more accurate so that we can do actual calculations and understand things uh, from, the, from the physical world. Now, at the same time, we would like to have a fundamental understanding of what temperature is. And um, hopefully this, uh, this screencast on lecture four will allow us to get the first definition of temperature that's rooted in, um, in fundamental aspect of physics. So let's do it. So first of all, let's consider those, those, three, um, those three systems here. Uh, and uh, we have those three uh, different uh, snapshots. Uh, let's first look at the first one, which is initial. And we're going to suppose that we have two systems that are isolated initially. And one is hot, it's a temperature T1, and the one it's cold, it's temperature T2. And T1 is larger than T2. So after, after a little bit, we are going to turn on the contact between the two objects. And uh, a contact is here uh, symbolized by um, the black uh, rod, uh, the, vert the horizontal rod. And so, so long, as soon as you put, uh, you put the two system in contact, um, there will be a flow of heat. So there will be an energy transfer between the hot body to the cold body. Remember what we said at the, la at the end of last week, of last uh, lecture, that uh, uh, heat always flows from the hot body to a cold body if there is no other event happening, no other process. So it's going to flow until uh, what you find out at some point is that the temperature between the two uh, systems become uh, uh, the temperatures become the same and uh, it's basically reached equilibrium and there's no more uh, heat flow okay so the two systems are in equilibrium and they have the same temperature so this is what's called a thermal equilibrium and so we can also call this a thermalization which is the this action of bringing two bodies with, that are initially at different temperature to the same temperature and this is done through the flow of heat Okay, so this is a way to say that the two bodies now have the same temperature. It still doesn't tell us what temperature is, but at least we know of a mechanism to thermalize uh, two systems. Something that's very important about this that you can already note is that something irreversible just happened. Clearly, if you take two systems with different temperature and uh, a, a series of them with a, a variation of temperature, there will be a thermalization until the two systems have the same temperature. So how do we know what temperature we started with? Basically, we can't because the system, are not, the, the system is not reversible. So the thermalization is not reversible. So we'll get, we, of course, will talk much more about reversible uh, process as we move along this course. So all this is nice. And this leads us to what's sometimes called the zero earth law of thermodynamics as you can imagine it's zero not so much because we uh, use python or c++ where we start counting at zero but more because uh, it's a law that was added later as uh, just to to, uh, to to clarify things okay so the zero earth uh, law of thermodynamics says that if you take two systems which are in thermal equilibrium just like the one we saw and, we, and you put them uh, in contact with a third uh, that's that is in equilibrium, then the two systems are, will be in equilibrium with each other. So two systems which separately in equilibrium with a third will be in equilibrium with uh, each other. Okay. So that seems to be kind of obvious, but really um, that's an important result, uh, which looks pretty obvious, but. Uh, the point remains that this law basically says that there is such a thing as a definition of temperature. That's really what it says. Another way to say it is that 
we can call the, the test body, if you will, the second body, as a thermometer, right? Uh, that means that uh, uh, it, it looks like we can calibrate a, a, a property that we will call temperature and that we will define in a few minutes. We can use that property temperature to, as, as, a, as a gauge to describe the thermal equilibrium of each system. Okay. This is all fairly formal and all fairly, maybe fairly abstract at this point, but this is an important result because otherwise that means that even the, the concept of temperature will be irrelevant. Okay? So another way to say that the, the law of thermodynamics is that it, it basically means that we can make thermometers, okay? and thermometers work. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about thermometers for a second. So, First of all, and this is something that's important to remember, in order for a thermometer to work well, its heat capacity must be lower than that of the object uh, whose temperature you want to measure. Okay? Uh, otherwise, the measurement itself, okay, the measurement itself would actually modify modify the properties. Okay? So let's try to think about it. Let's suppose that uh, you have a thermometer that's a very high high heat capacity and you try to measure your temperature with it. So what you're going to do is that if you do that, that means that, um, that, means that the, the, temp the, the, the temperature of, the, of basically the thermometer will not change, okay? Because it has a very high heat capacity, you would need a lot of heat to change temperature. So that would be essentially useless to, to use that. So it has to be a very low uh, heat capacity, in other words, any transfer of heat to the thermometer will lead to a change in temperature, just uh, the same way as we defined heat capacity in a couple of lectures ago. Of course, the most, uh, the, 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 the best known thermometer, at least uh, used to be, was this simple thermometer that, uh, that's, that works with, with uh, typically with, uh, with mercury. Um, I don't know, probably don't make many of those anymore simply because mercury is a not very friendly substance and it can be, can be messy. But the point is the first thermometer that was made was, I mean, not the first, but traditionally the thermometer was made of a column of mercury, let's say, or a column of, of, some, of some, uh, some liquid that can, can have a thermal expansion like, like alcohol, for instance. And the idea is like this. The idea is that we still don't know what uh, temperature is, but we know that temperature can be translated into something that can be physically measured. So for example, the height of the column of alcohol or mercury is always the same if you have an object that's a given temperature. So even though we cannot really put our finger of what temperature is, we have a way of measuring it, okay? And when I mean measuring it, I really mean we can compare bodies and we say, for example, which have different temperatures, we can say, for example, the first body will bring the height of the alcohol height, will bring it to a certain length, a certain height, while another body will bring it to half that height. And so we conclude from this that the temperature of body one is twice the temperature of body two. Okay? So we can get that information between the body. So this is very important. And we can do that because of the zero earth law of, uh, of uh, thermodynamics. Okay? So of course, people that, uh, that are well known who have uh, built this are Fahrenheit or Celsius. And that's, of course, you know, that they are now temperature scale that are named after them. And uh, that, that's, again, for historical reason. But clearly, measuring a temperature does not have to be done with a column of mercury or, 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 or alcohol, so long as there is a physical property that depends on temperature that we can measure, then we can infer what the temperature is. So examples of this are, for example, the resistance, the electrical resistance. Uh, electrical resistance, um, uh, of course, depends on the temperature. So it's, for, exa for an example, on, the, on this slide, it's, uh, uh, platinum, um, which uh, there was resistance, uh, depends uh, almost linearly with temperature, at least for high enough temperature. And or we have the uh, RuO2 as well can be used. 
and and that one is actually the other way around the temperature goes uh, the, the resistance goes down as the temperature goes up okay so it's a different thing but the point remains that for a given temperature you get a given resistance and the given resistance you get different a, a given temperature so again you can use that as a gauge to measure temperature we still don't know exactly what, what temperature is but we actually see the smoking gun of temperature there are other ways to make thermometers of course some of them uh, uh, any of them that will use um, that will use a, a relationship between the measurable properties and temperature will work. For example, if we use the ideal gas equation PV equal nKBT, uh, if we are if we keep the volume constant and the number of molecule constant, measuring the pressure, okay, which can be measured with the, with other means. Uh, will give you information about temperature. And of course, if you keep pressure constant but modify volume, then you can also get a gauge of temperature. So all this shows that uh, we can measure temperature. It's possible thanks to the zeroth law. Okay. Uh, so this is all good. And just what I mentioned here, we can use measurable properties, but we still don't exactly know um, how to do it in a fundamental way. Okay. And on top of that, all those methods, of course, are limited by the physical properties. For example, if you take mercury, you cannot measure all temperature with mercury. Okay, there will be a place where mercury is solidified. If it's solidified, that means that, of course, the properties depend uh, a lot on, on the state of matter. And uh, there, will be, there will be no such thing as a, as a modification of, of height as a function of temperature in that case. There are all sorts of things, the resistance, the electrical resistance of platinum, also saturate and, and that kind of thing. So we do not know. But what matters is that this empirical property, those empirical properties are very useful when we, for the development of thermodynamics before there was a more fundamental understanding of what temperature is. So there must be an absolute definition of temperature and, and that's what we will do. In fact, we will even demonstrate that uh, uh, later, not today, but we will demonstrate that the temperature, uh, there is an absolute scale which uh, which actually started zero, and, and for fundamental reason, we cannot go any lower. We will discuss this. Okay, so what matters is that um, in the 19th century, so, so quite a long time ago, uh, there was some, uh, some methods, which is actually a, a kind of an abstract method called Carnot engine, that which we'll, we'll spend a lot of time on, um, could show that temperature is really a fundamental property based of the statistical properties of matter just like like we discussed about you know at the level of molecules and atoms and uh, this is something that's uh, that's that's nice but historically of course temperature was was an empirical property and was not definitely not based of uh, the the molecular properties of matter but we'll get there okay before we move there, let's try to move to something that's extremely central for the understanding of thermodynamics in general. And this is actually, uh, in my personal opinion, one of the most central concepts to understand in order to go anywhere with statistical physics. And to, in fact, understand how you go from uh, how you actually justify uh, the laws of thermodynamics. So let's try, to, I'm going to try to spend a few minutes explaining to you the next topic, which is the difference between a micro and a macro state. So about those micro and macro state. So in order to understand this, let's try to think a little bit about uh, uh, actual problem. Very often, understanding by example is the best way to move forward. So let's suppose that you have 100 coins, 100 quarters, for example, American quarters. Uh, and you have heads, the 50% of head and 50% of tail, and you suppose that you you are going to to have your you have your 100 um, 100 coins, and you are going to shake you're going to put them in a bag, and you're going to shake the bag, okay? And then you put put all the coins on the table, and then after that you measure the you cal you measure the number of uh, you I mean you calculate the number of heads and number of of tails, okay? Uh, clearly, we are going to suppose that each possible outcome of this experiment is like is, is equally likely, okay? Simply because each coins are going to be uh, fair coins, so that means that uh, uh, the number of possibilities, of course, is going to be two to the power one hundred, right? 
it's two for the first coin, two for the second, two for the third, so two times, two times, two hundred times. So you have two to the power hundred different configurations in there, right? That's, that's the idea. Now that means that if they are all equally likely, the probability of finding any of them, of any configuration, is extremely small, right? It's 10 to 2 to the power minus 100. And this is something that you do have to understand very importantly. This, this system is called a microstate. So a microstate is a state where we know the state, the status, if you will, of each particular coin. But any of those microstates has an extremely small probability, simply because there are so many possible states that we can have. So a microstate, you have a lot of them, okay? So a microstate is any specific realization of the experiment, okay? So that's good, so you have that. Now, clearly, um, you are usually not interested to know what is the is coin one head or tail, coin seven head or tail, ten, uh, coin t uh, 29 head or, t or tail. What you're interested in is to know how many are head and how many are tail. Okay? So you are interested in something that's macroscopic. You are interested in number of heads versus number of tails. And this is, uh, this is of course, what, what you are going to measure. And this is that particular state is going to co be considered a macro state. So I'm going to give you a second to think about about this, uh, about how many macro states you have. And um, if you want to think about it before seeing the answer, you should pause the the screencast now. Uh, okay. So I'm going to suppose that you paused it and you restarted it. So the number of macro state is of course 101, right? How do I calculate this? Well. There is, the, there is the probability of having one, uh, zero head, one head, two head, three head, and so on, and 100 head, 100 head, okay? The other one will be in a tail. So that means I have 101 macro states. So this is actually quite <laughs> different. You have 101 macro states, which is not too many, really, compared to two to the power 100 possible configurations, or two to the power 100 microstate okay so this is this is quite quite something so the difference between microstate and macrostate is very important so for example how many possible configurations do i have for 50 heads and 50 tails so let me try to take my time here the configuration that has 50 heads and 50 tails is a macrostate it's a state that represents collection of possible out uh, one outcome and a number of possible realization of that outcome. So how many ways can I get this? Well, that's what we did in lecture one. This is a combinatorics. It's the what, how many possibilities do I have to take 50 head out of 100 coins? Well, this is nothing else than the CNR that we saw, right? And the result is, of course, this. Okay, it's 100 factorial divided by 50 factorial divided by 50 factorial. And if you calculate that number, you will find that the number of microstate uh, that correspond to 50 heads and 50 tails is 4, 10 to the power 27. So this is the difference between a macrostate and microstate. And remember, we are just talking about 100 coins. Okay, we are not talking about, about Avogadro number of coins. We are talking about a fairly modest number of coins. Okay? Now, this is very important to realize the difference between microstate and macrostate because what you measure is a, ma is a macrostate. Okay? But what's happening under the hood of physics is a microstate. All right? Okay, so here's the deal. What, what is more likely, in your opinion? To, to observe a macrostate that correspond to few microstates or to observe a macrostate that correspond to many microstates? Obviously, the answer is that the more microstate correspond to a macrostate, the more likely it is to measure it, simply because each microstate is equally likely. So for the macrostate, you add all those probabilities so you have actually many more chances to measure a macrostate uh, 
which has a lot of microstates. And this is, and a lot of the, of the, a lot of thermodynamics is based off that observation, okay? And this is the reason why it's going to be on, in red in this slide. The most likely macrostate that the system will find itself in is the one that corresponds to the largest number of microstates. Wow, this is a very, very important um, observation. And uh, this, is, this actually justifies uh, most of what uh, we observe uh, in thermodynamics or even in, in physics, actually. OK? Good. Now, here is a lot of text on this slide. But the idea of this slide is that um, uh, what is a macro state? Macro state is going to be a, a state that has specific observation. So for example, a state that's a given temperature, a state that has a given pressure. So something that is related to a macroscopically available information, like uh, total energy, for example. Okay? But the advantage, of course, of this is that and this is the difference between thermodynamics and statistical physics. The advantage is that you do not need to know the properties of each individual microstate. In fact, you can't. There are just too many of them, right? Just the example of 100 coins was exact, is extremely difficult to get all the microstates at once, OK? So usually, we do not know them. Uh, and then we are going to see a lot of examples of them. But we can infer a lot of properties on the observ observable of the observation uh, based of the underlying mechanism that a macro state that you are most likely to observe is the one that corresponds to the most micro state. And of course, that's nice because that will allow us to jump now with that knowledge about micro state and macro state to a statistical definition of temperature. OK, so let's do this. And we are going to consider the system that's uh, depicted on the right. We have two systems. Each of them have a different temperature, a different amount of energy, and also a different number of microstates. So the notation we will, will be using for the number of microstates will be a, a capital uh, omega, omega 1, and omega 2 in this case. So basically, omega 1 is the number of microstates for system 1 at, temp at energy E1. And of course, the same thing for the system 2, which will be omega 2 will be the total number of micro state for system 2 at energy E2. And again, I like to insist on the fact that we do not necessarily know those micro state, OK? But this is what we know about them. So we have a, uh, we, we did not need to enter with, we didn't need to um, include the definition of temperature yet. Tem temperature is going to come uh, naturally from, from, this, uh, from this here. So let's do this. So we are going to put those two systems in thermal contact, just like we did at the beginning of this, of this screencast. And uh, we suppose that the two systems together are isolated from the rest of the universe. So when we do that, that means that they cannot exchange energy outside of them. So they can exchange energy between them because there is a contact, but there is no way to exchange energy, either getting energy from outside or giving energy outside because they are isolated systems. Okay? So that means that the total energy of the system is E1 plus E2, which is a constant. Okay? So it's assumed fixed. Good. Now the system have, as I just said, omega 1 and omega 2 microstate, and we will suppose they have each equal probability which is a very good supposition. This is, this is typically the case. OK, good. Now, here is the thing. Uh, the whole system now has omega 1 times omega 2 microstate. So this is something to, to I hope that you, you, you can see why we multiply here. Let's think about uh, you have a, a bag of 100 coin on the left and a bag of 100 coin on the right. Uh, the total number of microstates will be 2 to the power 200. So basically, 2 to the power 100 times 2 to the power 100. Okay, So that's just to give you an idea that the total number of microstates for the entire system is the product of the number of microstates for each subsystem. Good. Very nice. Uh, 
we are, we are going to suppose now that the systems are in thermal equilibrium, okay? After sufficient time, they're going to be in thermal equilibrium. So what does that mean? Uh, what we know from the previous uh, slide and the red box is that the system at equilibrium will appear to have chosen a macroscopic configuration, so a macrostate, that will maximize the number of microstates, right? This is the idea, just like we said, the more likely macrostate is the one that has the largest number of microstates. And of course, you know where we are going with this. What we are going with this is that we end up with an optimization problem. The optimization problem is to maximize the number of states. So something that we are very familiar with uh, in physics. So let's do it. And of course, before we do that, let's remember that it's going to work if each microstate is equally likely to occur. The system um, can actually uh, um, can actually uh, has a possibility to uh, explore and visit, if you will, every single microstate. And then if there is enough time, the system will explore all of them and uh, will spend an equal time in each of them. So basically, the, the physics there will not be uh, polluted, if you will, by the difficulty to reach the microstate. This is called the ergodic hypothesis, hypothesis and we'll probably discuss this uh, in much more detail later. But the ergodic, ergodic is really related to the fact that you have, if you give enough time, you, your system will explore um, all the all the degrees of freedom, if you will. Okay. So uh, okay, very nice. So just just a repeat of what I just said. Uh, we will go and see at uh, we will, we are going to find this, the the macro state that correspond to the largest number of micro states. I would like to insist on something though. Uh, the example with the coins can be somewhat misleading, even though the most uh, likely um, state is 50 heads and 50 tails. If you remember, it only corresponded to 10 to the power 27. It's a large number, but it's a, it's a large number, but there were way many other possibilities that were not quite as likely, but also very likely. You have to realize that thermodynamics really deal with much larger system. The n is not equal to 100, but more equal to Avogadro number of particles. So in that case, the likelihood is like uh, overwhelmingly likely. It's a little bit as if somebody told you, you go play, um, you, you, you just, it's, it's, it's as, as if somebody told you, you take a, a coin and you have to flip it until you find a tail, but it can only become a tail if you uh, do it uh, for your entire life. And you know that the probability that it's going to be tail will only happen once in your entire life. And that probability is, of course, tiny, or supposing that you do it all the time. Uh, and in fact, it's tiny, but still much larger than what the, the probability it would be if we had actually a, uh, uh, an Avogadro number of, of system to look, at, look into. So this is something that's very important, this idea of scaling with the number of particles that we are dealing with. OK, so let's go. Let's do it. Let's, let's actually now focus on the calculation. What is the most probable uh, macro state? Well, as I just said, that's going to be the one that maximizes the total number of micro state of the total system, right? And we are going to put together everything that we've studied so far, and we are going to formalize it into math that's going to help us a lot, OK? So what's nice is that what we want is that we want uh, E1 and E2 uh, are going to, th there's going to be a, an exchange of, of th there was an exchange of energy between the two systems such that the temperature was the same and at equilibrium E1 and E2 uh, were given by the value that I, I mean, were given by the value uh, that, that were in the, in, the, in the schematics that I showed. All right. So we want to minimize, actually, sorry, we want to maximize the product omega 1 times omega 2. And that means that we want to find the energy state of each of these system so that it's maximized. And of course, because um, because an E1 uh, plus E2 is conserved, uh, we can optimize this as a function of the energy E1. OK, good. So we have to calculate this. Now, clearly, this is a very simple uh, derivative. It's a derivative of a product. So we are going to get simply the, the chain rule, and we are going to obtain something like this, right? 
that's actually fairly straightforward. Right. Good. Uh, of course, we have uh, already uh, just played a little bit of calculus on the right hand side. There we, we added DE1 over DE2 for, for symmetry. Now, what's nice is that because the total energy is constant, E1 plus E2 is a constant, that means that any change in E1 will be exactly equal to minus the same change in E2. In, in math, <coughs> that means that DE1 is equal to minus DE2. In other words, D of E1 plus E2 is equal to zero. In other words, E1 plus E2 is a constant. So, so far, so good. That also means that uh, DE1 over DE2 uh, DE2 over DE1, actually DE1 over DE2 is just the same thing, is equal to minus 1. And that will allow us to simplify the equation above, of course, by replacing DE2 over DE1 by minus 1. Uh, again, this is an important thing. You, this, is a, this is a mathematical translation of saying that the system is in isolation. Okay? The two systems cannot exchange energy with their surrounding. So you end up with this equation right here. And of course, you, this is where uh, calculus uh, of basic functions come uh, very handy. Uh, you know that uh, when you take a derivative of a function divided by that function, this is actually the derivative of the, the logarithm. So what we really have is that we have the derivative of the logarithm of the number of microstates of system 1 is equal to the derivative with respect to E2 of the logarithm of the number of microstates in system 2. So this is actually fairly straightforward and fa fairly uh, um, basic to, to get to this point. But this is extremely important because what we just demonstrated there is, is a mathematical formula that translates the, the, the concept of thermalization. At equilibrium, the equilibrium state will be such that the total number of microstates will be optimized, will be actually maximized. And in fact, that, uh, that condition is translated mathematically by this. And it's so important, I'm going to repeat it on this slide in red. Um, and it's exactly what I, as I mentioned now. I mean, the text that's on, the, on this slide is exactly what I mentioned uh, a second ago. And it's going to, to basically give us a, an idea of what, of, what, uh, of what thermalization is. So what's interesting is that what's on the left of this equation only depends on system one. What's on the right only depends on system two. And it intuitively translates this idea that temperature one and temperature two uh, have been, uh, have been uh, the same, have been thermalized, so T1 is equal to T2 at uh, equilibrium. So clearly, we could define temperature um, using some of those, of those symbols there. And in fact, uh, the way it's done, and it's an extremely important result, is going to give us a mathematical definition of temperature. Uh, the max, and, and of course, we expect the temperature to depend on uh, the derivative of the, log of the logarithm of the number of microstates with respect to energy. And the way it is done is actually we do not define temperature like this, but instead we define 1 over temperature, uh, simply because temperature goes up uh, when, uh, I mean, the, because of the way the temperature varies with the number of, of microstates. And I don't want to go into details now because we will, we will explore this uh, later. Um, OK. And of course, we see again KB, just the same KB as we saw uh, for, the, uh, for the ideal gas law. And this is, again, uh, the Boltzmann constant, which essentially defines the units. Okay? This is what allows us to uh, translate energy, so Joule, into Kelvin. All right? Uh, you see that it all works because, of course, the logarithm of the number of microstates has no unit. So, of course, that means the temperature is, has to be, if we want temperature to be Kelvin, Kb has to be Joule per, per Kelvin, since E has the unit of, of Joule. So, it's always a good idea to check that your units are correct. So, that's, that's good. So, we've just came up with a definition of temperature that follows um, this extremely important concept that I'm going to repeat again repeat again is the fact that the macro state so the more the most likely macro state is the one that corresponds to the largest number of micro state and the temperature is simply a translation of that fact okay all right that's what we just did in one slide very very um, 
straightforward uh, mathematics optimization problem. Now, in, in physics, we know that temperature is very important, energy is very important, um, and very often uh, we have lots of constraint when we do thermodynamics, and we've already seen constraint when we discussed the heat capacity. We saw, uh, we saw that it was different, the heat capacity was different if we were using constant pressure or constant volume, and we had this constraint. So very often in physics, we need to find a way to define those constraints. Uh, there are different ways to do it. You can do it in differential equations, or you can also uh, name the, the type of ensemble that we are going to work with. So this is one of those definitions that you should really commit to memory uh, uh, for as long as you can, is that we have uh, the different system. Uh, that these are names. They, they come from, of course, historical names. Uh, this idea is that uh, the micro-canonical ensemble is a is a, is, a, is an ensemble of system that have the same that have a given energy so micro canonical means same energy uh, the canonical ensemble is a system that has um, the same uh, temperature okay so if they have all the same temperature we are going to see that can canonical and then the grand canonical are those uh, that have uh, uh, I would say the temperature is constant, but also the chemical potential is constant. We are going to see example of that later. But these are definitions, again, this is just to be able to all speak the same language, uh, and uh, we will meet a number of them uh, more uh, later in, in this course. So I would like to spend a little bit of time on the canonical ensemble. So canonical ensemble is, assemble, is, is, an, is an ensemble of systems that have the same uh, temperature. And this is going to be the, the next slide here. So we are going to first discuss a very important concept, which is the concept of reservoir. Uh, a reservoir is something that we use uh, to keep the temperature constant. So basically, it's the idea is like this. A reservoir is a huge system. Okay, Sometimes we call it a heat bath. It's extremely large. Okay, it's actually as large as it gets, and if it's not large enough, you just make it larger. The point is, it's a system that no matter how much energy you take out from it, you keep the same temperature. Okay, so um, that's that's basically the idea of a reservoir, and 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 this is very useful because that means that uh, it's going to impose that reservoir is going to impose a temperature. Why? Because we know that the the idea of of equilibrium thermalization, if we have a, syst a subsystem that keeps its, its temperature no matter what, clearly the other system that are put in contact with it will eventually, at equilibrium, get reach that temperature. So that's that's essentially a way to impose a canonical ensemble. It's a way to impose a temperature to be fixed. So this is something that that's uh, that's extremely important, of course. And because it's going to change quite a bit, uh, quite a few things in the mathematics that we are going to see, because that means the temperature is constant, so the, all the derivative with respect to temperature will disappear, which is always nice. Okay, so let's suppose that we have a system at the beginning that has an energy E, and we suppose that we're putting in system to a smaller system, okay, so, so we have a reservoir, that's a system, the first system, and then we have a, another smaller system we call, we call the system, and when they are put in equilibrium, there is some energy epsilon that's being transferred between one system and the other. Okay, I'm not saying if it's a positive or negative at this point, but the point is there is at equilibrium uh, energy, uh, the total energy is conserved, it's E, but because it's, these systems are isolated from the rest of the world, and uh, the energy that from the reservoir, uh, whatever energy was lost from the reservoir is in the system and vice versa. Okay, so of course the number of microstates in the reservoir is omega, and it depends on the energy. We've discussed this, so the energy e, uh, omega of e minus epsilon, and you know that temperature, of course, of the reservoir is related to the logarithm of omega, of the derivative of the logarithm of omega with respect to the energy, which is what we just said in the previous slide. Nice. So this is a very simple system, and. We are going to do something very, uh, very simple. The simplest problem possible is that we are suppo we suppose the system is so simple that it can only accommodate one microstate for each value of the energy. Okay, 
So for given energy of uh, value of the energy, it has one microstate. So we're going to fix the total energy of the system. There's a reason why we have E minus epsilon on the left and epsilon on the right. And of course, the probability the system has energy epsilon is proportional to the number of microstates, right? The probability that the system has the, the small system, when, when I could say system, I mean the small system, has a probability that it has energy epsilon, is going to be related to the number of microstates in the reservoir times the number of microstates in the system. But as I told you, the number of microstates in the system is one by, by, uh, by construction. Okay? So the probability that the system will actually transfer epsilon between the system and the reservoir is the one that's written there on the left-hand side. Good. Now, uh, we are, since it's a small system and the energy that can be transferred is small, we are going to, we've, it feels like the right thing to do about this is to use Taylor expansion uh, for the value of epsilon, right? So if epsilon is small compared to E, uh, this is probably something that's correct. And again, we also know that uh, what matters is the logarithm. The logarithm of omega is what gives us something that's related to temperature, right? Because temperature is a derivative. So we are going to calculate the logarithm of omega of E minus epsilon, and we are doing a Taylor expansion of that value. So we end up with something like this, the first, uh, the, the zeroth and first order uh, term of the uh, Taylor expansion of the logarithm of the number of microstates is going to be given by, by this equation. And of course, we, we Im immediately see why we did this, right? Because the derivative there is related to temperature. We just, we just did that in the previous slide, OK? So what's nice is that, in fact, we see that what we obtain is that the logarithm of omega e minus epsilon is the logarithm of omega of e minus epsilon divided by kBt, OK? So remember, the epsilon is the energy of the small system. So you see, if you now, um, if you if you now substitute uh, omega e minus epsilon into the probability of epsilon uh, about halfway in the middle of this slide, you see that the probability, in fact, is proportional to the exponential of minus epsilon divided by kBt. Okay, if you don't see this right away, I, I suggest you pause this screencast and spend a few seconds uh, convincing you of this. The point is, uh, once you're convinced, is to see that the probability distribution is, uh, is actually depends on the exponential of minus epsilon divided by kBt. So this is interesting because, um, of course, you've, no, you've probably met this distribution before. It's called the Boltzmann distribution. Uh, but we just proved it in just half a slide, I would say. But, but uh, before we can move further, we need to understand a little bit more about this distribution. Just like we've done uh, so far, we've discussed about probability distribution in previous uh, screencast, uh, we see that uh, there are some properties of the distribution we need to, we need to make sure that we are, we are happy with. And one of them is, of course, that it has to be normalized. So we are going to do that in the, in the, in, in the next slide. Uh, but before we do that, uh, let's, let's try to see, a, let's have a plot of, of this. So the probability uh, is proportional to the uh, decaying exponential. And you see that the larger the temperature, the larger the temperature, uh, so, so if, if the temperature is, is really large, the, the, this probability actually flattens. So the probability gets higher and higher for large value of epsilon. Okay? So if th this, is, this is very important because now if the temperature is actually very, very, very small, then you see that we, the probability gets, gets very much uh, only important for when epsilon is also very small. Okay? So basically, KBT seems to be a measure of the range that, that as a macrostate with, or a microstate in this case, of, um, of value epsilon can be, uh, can be uh, populated. Right? This is this is a Boltzmann distribution, a probability. So Boltzmann distribution is really a probability of finding a state in a given energy. That's nice. So um, this is exactly what I just mentioned uh, now, but it's in, in text now in, in the in the in this on the slide. 
so we see that the exponential goes down very quickly. It's an exponential, so exponential always goes down very quickly uh, by design. And, uh, but that also means that um, the KBT kind of uh, uh, provides you kind of the idea of which states are likely and not likely. But before we can make, uh, um, as I mentioned a few seconds ago, before we can make uh, predictions, we need to normalize the distribution, of course, because if we want the Boltzmann distribution to be a proper uh, probability distribution, it certainly has to be normalized. In, in other words, the pro total probability should be equal to 1. So we need to normalize. So let's do this, and we are going to introduce a, yet again a new concept. So please keep it up, keep up with all the, the concepts. Each single concept is actually fairly straightforward, but there are many of them. In each lecture, there are a few. So uh, provide, I'll provide you a list of those concepts as well in a separate uh, document, as you know. OK, let's move on. The probability, uh, the best way to normalize this, and we are going to suppose that we have a finite number of energy that can be, can, that can be uh, reached. Uh, simply, the best way to do this if, is to uh, divide the probability of a specific energy by the sum of all the probabilities. And I invite you to prove that this probability distribution is indeed normalized. Of course, if you sum over R, you are going to have a sum, of, uh, a sum on the numerator and a sum in the denominator that are the same. So of course the probability, the total probability, the sum of probability will be equal to one. Okay, that's good. Now here's the thing: the the, the denominator is extremely important in physics and in, in thermodynamics. In fact, it's it's a crucial thing, and it's called the partition function. Okay, so this is one of those uh, those um, definitions that you should commit to memory as well. The partition function it gets it has a z for because it is. Uh, Germanic uh, origin, but there's not what matters here is that this particular function, which is the normalization uh, factor, if you will, is called a partition function. So it's not always easy to appreciate that it's extremely difficult to calculate the partition function because in order to calculate the partition function, you need to need you need to know all the value of the energies EI that you can attain. So you can say, well, that's easy enough. No, it's not because this means that EI can it's absolutely all of them, okay? You need to really to include all of them in order to have a good description of what you have, okay? Uh, because depending on temperature, may different value of the energy can be, can be attained depending on the exponential as we've seen a second ago. So this is important, but let's say for now, we will of course talk about the partition function much more in a future lecture, but let's, say, let's suppose for now that the partition function is simply a normalization factor. So basically what we've just done is to demonstrate the Boltzmann distribution function using statistical argument, okay? And we could do that because um, we could do that because we just define a temperature, all right? So that was, that was very nice, that was very nice. Now we are going to, to, to uh, explore a little bit uh, an example of for you to understand where this is all coming from and then uh, we will show some application of the Boltzmann distribution and it will be done with the screencast. So the example goes like this, and if you have issues understanding it, I uh, invite you to, to try to code it up for yourself with uh, uh, simply with a Python routine or any, any kind of language you want, it's not very complicated. So we are going to suppose that we, here we, this is an example that's taken directly from the, from the textbook that we use for this, for this series of screencasts. And uh, this is a 20 by 20 grid. And uh, this is essentially a macro state. Uh, no, actually, it's a, it, this is a micro state. Uh, the micro state is a, is a specific realization of how many quanta of energy are, uh, occupies each site. So we have 400 sites, 20 by 20. And initially, we are going to put one single quantum of energy when we say quantum of energy, we don't necessarily mean that we are doing, doing quantum mechanics, okay? We just say an, um, a certain amount of energy from, from, the, from the Latin root of the word quantum uh, here. Uh, it doesn't have to be quantum mechanics. Uh, so we have um, an energy on each side, okay? And this is, a, of course, uh, how likely is this? Well, just, just, just it's a good idea now to think a little bit about macro state between micro state and micro state, the difference between them.
So let's say somebody tells you that a macro state is a state that's uniformly distributed in energy. Okay, this is something that's, that could be possibly measured. Uh, this is it. Okay, this is as uniform in energy as, as it gets. How many possible uh, realization of these states are there? Well, there is only one single realization. It's right there. Each site has one quantum of energy. Okay? So is it likely? It's extremely unlikely, of course, because it's only one microstate. And I mentioned to you that the most likely macrostate will be the one that corresponds to the largest number of microstates. So this is certainly not a good candidate. Now, let's suppose that we, uh, we let the system evolve. And what do you mean by evolve? We say that randomly, we, what we do, we randomly pick a quantum of energy on the grid and we place it on another site, which is also randomly uh, picked. The first step will be something like this. Okay, one site will have two quanta of energy and one site will have zero quantum of energy. Okay, and you look at the, you look at the, the, the histogram on the right hand side, most of the quantum, mo most of uh, the site have one quantum, and in fact, one side has two quantum, but we don't even see it on the plot because it's so small. It's one up, it's one divided by 400, right? So it's not many. And then you keep doing this. You keep doing this forever, and, and you, just, you just keep picking one quantum, uh, and then you just move it. And you keep doing this over and over and over and over again. You just let it run forever. And when you're done, uh, you end up with something that looks like this, okay? Uh, this equilibrium, by the way, is a dynamical equilibrium. That's just it's something important to know. I mean, equilibrium doesn't mean it gets stuck. It can, you can keep doing this. However, what is stuck, what does not change anymore, is the distribution on the right-hand side, the histogram on the right-hand side. And that histogram turns out to exactly follow uh, this distribution, this Boltzmann distribution, where the largest, uh, with, where the most likely macro state, so the macro state corresponding to the largest number of micro states, are favored. So this is a very good example, and there was no fundamental physics that was get, that, that we used to to do this plot. It's just a matter of likelihood and statistical physics. So this is really an example showing the thermodynamics even though we describe it with micros microscopic properties, really all stems from the microscopic properties. Now you can wonder, what's the temperature? What's the role of temperature in this particular, uh, in this particular example? Well, the temperature, it turns out, is the total number of energy, so the total number of quanta that you used. So what you could do for fun is to repeat this but with more quanta. So another example would be to use to start with a grid of two quanta of energy on, on each side and just do again the experiment. And if you did that, you would obtain a result like this. Again, uh, this is something you have uh, from the book. And you see that it's very much similar to, the, to what we've seen before, but it has a longer tail. Uh, the exponential has a longer tail simply because the temperature is larger, therefore the tail is larger for the exponential. You see also fluctuations here, and the fluctuation that you see on the right hand side, right, it's not completely monotonous, come from the fact that you have a finite grid. You have a 20 by 20 grid, which is actually not very large, even though it already shows all the properties of the Boltzmann distribution. Now you can go further and you look at the much bigger lattice, and this is an example here of a, of a much bigger lattice. And then we do a much bigger lattice, for example, a 1000 by 1000 lattice. Uh, you can, in fact, uh, calculate, uh, you can redo this calculation and see how well uh, the, the distribution, the, so the, the, yeah, the histogram of the distribution of quanta follows a Boltzmann equation. And in fact, here, uh, it follows exactly Boltzmann equation. Uh, how do I know that? It's a straight line, but it's a, if you notice, it's a logarithmic scale. And when you try to plot an exponential on a logarithmic scale, you see, of course, a straight line, straight line going down because of the minus in the exponential. So this shows really this very simple computational um, uh, experiment shows you that everything has to do with these fundamental properties of, of probabilities. Good. Now let's try to go a little, before we move forward further and, and, some, and show some demonstration of Boltzmann distribution, I'd like to uh, give you an idea of a, a useful shorthand that all physicists use in thermodynamics. Uh, because we have a factor of one over KBT all over the place, 
uh, we usually have a shorthand notation, which is beta, beta, uh, uh, which is one of the KBT. And of course, the definition of beta is that it's the first derivative of the logarithm, the natural log logarithm of omega over the energy. This is just a notation uh, that we will use quite a bit in this course. I'm going to show you uh, some application of uh, the Boltzmann distribution now. And uh, one thing that I'd like to really discuss with you is what's called the Boltzmann factor. Um, I'm going to show you three examples. There are four in the book. Uh, I just picked three out of four. Uh, you are welcome to go and, and check out the, 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 the last, the, the, actually the third one that I skipped, which, one, which is the one with the chemical reaction. Okay, but the first one I'd like to do a little bit in detail is a two-state system. The two-state system is essentially a system we can only have two states. And uh, we want to see what's the, the probability uh, distribution that we have uh, that's reminded on the top right of this slide for the Boltzmann distribution. Uh, two states mean, means that we can only have two energies. So we are going to suppose we have an energy zero and a, an energy, a finite energy epsilon, okay? Uh, which is positive. And so when we do that, we find that the probability P0 is obtained directly by uh, substituting ER by zero, and, by, and we get P epsilon by substituting ER by epsilon. And the partition function in this case is just the sum of two terms, which is one plus E minus beta epsilon. So beta has been defined as one over KBT uh, in uh, uh, the previous slide. So we get actually, in this case, we can calculate the partition function because we only have two states. And uh, we get the probability distribution. We know it exactly, in fact. Okay? We know exactly everything in this discrete, uh, discrete system. Now, that means that it's nice because we can calculate all the expectation values. Remember, expectation values is usually what you would, what you would measure on average if you measured enough time. So the question is, if you have a system like this, uh, you would say, if you, followed your, if you follow what you've been told when you were younger, which was, OK, the lowest energy state is the one that's occupied by the system. Well, if you did that, you know that the system will live in the E1 system. Okay? So that would be true at zero temperature. It turns out that the expectation value of the energy is going to be temperature dependent, in this case, beta dependent. So how do we calculate the, the energy of the system? Well, we calculate the expectation value. And the expectation value is calculated just like any expectation value, which is the value of the energy times its probability plus the value of the other energy times its probability. And when you do that, of course, you end up with the function that's written there, epsilon divided by e to the power beta epsilon plus 1. And you can plot this function uh, as a function of 1 over temperature. And you see that uh, at zero, so on the value zero on the x-axis means the temperature is, is infinite, right? That's what it's infinite means that essentially the probability of both E1 and E2 are the same. Therefore, the energy, of course, is the average between the two, epsilon over two. And when the temperature is very small, like zero, you see that the energy asymptotically uh, reach will reach zero, which simply means that when the temperature is zero, I mean exactly zero, uh, only E1 is occupied, while the probability of finding uh, E2 is zero. Okay, so everything makes a lot of sense. So we can understand this from these equations. Uh, we can also there, there is one thing that's very important that 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 I like to to insist a bit more is what's called the Boltzmann factor. The Boltzmann factor is essentially this exponential there that is repeated there. And this exponential always involves an energy divided by KBT. And so that energy can be an electronic system, can be a magnetic system, can be a, a, a velocity, can be a gravitational energy, like in this case. So this Boltzmann factor basically gives you the probability the relative probability, because we don't, of course, we need the partition function to normalize. But the idea is that we can get the probability of different things like this. So here, this is very, the problem is this. The problem looks very complicated, but it's not. It is, what's the number of molecules in an isothermal atmosphere as a function of height? So what's the, so let's try to, let's try to, to translate this. What's the probability 
of finding a particle, a, a molecule at height z. Okay. Um, you would say, well, it should always be down, right? But it's not quite because there is a finite probability. If the temperature is high enough, there is a finite probability that uh, that there is a height that's occupied. And in fact, that's what you measure with this Boltzmann um, factor. And the Boltzmann factor shows that unless the temperature is zero, uh, the distribution is not just centered at z equals zero. Okay, and this is come from the energy, the potential energy is equal mgz, where z is the height. Okay, and so what you find by doing this, you find that the number, the density of number of molecule in the atmosphere goes down exponentially. Of course, of course, this is, uh, as you know, this is an approximation because uh, clearly. Um, Clearly, the, the, the temperature is not constant in the atmosphere, right? So we, we are here, we are, we are working in a canonical ensemble with an isotherm. Uh, isothermal atmosphere is not very uh, realistic, but it's a good, it's a good first order approximation. Uh, as you know, the temperature goes down very quickly as you, as you move up in the atmosphere. Okay, very nice. So let's have a look at a third example, and uh, we are going to look at the sun. Uh, it turns out I already gave you the Boltzmann uh, factor here on the right hand side. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, of course, you know the sun works by uh, an important reaction, a nuclear reaction that's, that's, that's given uh, here um, with, with protons uh, leading to, to, to this reaction here with, uh, involving a neutrino. Uh, and in order to, to get, the, uh, and in order to, to get to, to, that, to that equation, of course, um, the problem is that the force and the nuclear force are, are very strong, but uh, before the proton can, can react, uh, you need to bring them together. And to bring them together, the energy you have to pay is electrostatic. It's electrostatic energy uh, is because you have two positive charges and it's very hard to bring them on top of each other. So the energy that, that's really important for the reaction here is the electrostatic repulsion between the two protons, which is of course given by Coulomb's law that's given there. And so uh, we know that the radius of a nucleus is about one uh, femtometer or 10 to the minus 15 meter. And the energy that's involved in, uh, in, in, in therefore the energy that's gonna be involved in, in, in this equation, electrostatic energy, because R is so tiny, the energy is going to be about one mega electron volt, which is which is a large energy, of course. So you need to have that energy available in order to to uh, to bring the two proton uh, close to one another due to the charge repulsion. I mean, because they have the same value of the charge. So that means that uh, if you know that the temperature at the center of the sun is 10 to the power 7 Kelvin, which is a huge temperature, of course, uh, the question you can ask yourself is that is that temperature enough? to have an appreciable uh, probability for that reaction to occur. So how do you answer that question? Well, you calculate the Boltzmann factor, which is just the one written there, e to my power minus e divided by kBT. So can we reach that one mega electron volt even for a temperature of 10 to the power seven? The answer is no. The answer is that that, ex that, that Boltzmann factor is extremely small, it's 10 to the power minus 400. So basically what we just proved here is that the sun does not work. <laughs> right? This is what this shows because the, the, the electrostatic repulsion is just too strong. So, I mean, it does work, okay? So just to, so what's happening? Uh, what's happening is that um, it does happen, the fusion happens simply because the energy barrier, so the energy that the, the particle need to have in order for this reaction to occur is not simply electrostatic. There is also a tunneling effect. And as you know, tunneling, uh, quantum mechanically, tunneling um, is also an exponential. So also reduce that energy of one mega electron volt by a lot. So you do not need to go all across the full barrier. You can tunnel through the barrier. And that's the reason why the fusion still happens, okay? So this is here a very interesting thing is that the Boltzmann distribution shows that uh, it should not happen, and that means clearly that we there's something wrong in the description. In this case, what's wrong is not the Boltzmann distribution per se. What's wrong is the fact that we cannot just use the electrostatic potential to see what is the, the rate of the equation, but instead we have to consider quantum mechanics, which we will, of course, not do uh, directly in this course. 
So it's time now to get to the summary of this extremely important lecture. Uh, because uh, it's extremely important because we have defined a temperature. And remember, we've defined a temperature using very much physical intuition that were based on the number of microstates, okay? And we did this by, by looking at the effect of the thermalization between two systems. And thermalization means putting them in contact. And we started from the fact that the two systems are in insulation uh, from the rest of the universe, so the total energy is constant, and from the fact that the, the most likely uh, uh, realization of that system will be the one for which the total number of microstates is maximized. And this is by imposing that optimization problem that we found this definition of the temperature. Uh, we discussed canonical ensemble. We discussed. I already meant, I also described micro canonical ensemble as one that has a system where everything has the same energy. But we spend most of the time on canonical ensemble, and then we found that the canonical ensemble for the one for which we have fixed temperature. So we have we 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 have a system that has fixed temperature. In other words, that means it is it is in contact with a reservoir. So another concept that you have to remember from this lecture: concept of reservoir. And if you do that, you can, in fact, calculate. You can, you can determine what is the probability distribution of, um, of a, such a system of mechanical ensemble. Uh, and this is called the Boltzmann distribution. And we've shown a couple of examples of the Boltzmann distribution. So I think that uh, we are going to study much more uh, this topic as we move forward. But you see that we are starting to build our course pretty nicely after just four lectures we've already been able to put our finger on on something that's that's quite fundamentally important so um, please take your time rev reviewing this uh, these slides uh, pause do the calculation make sure you don't take anything for granted and take it easy bye bye